written inside and on the back, literally a scroll, and it was sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book or the seal or the scroll and to break the seals. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep, uh, to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book and look into it. And one of the elders said to him, stop weeping. Behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the seals, the scroll, and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if he was uh, slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And he had taken the book, the scroll, and the four living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and gold, golden bowls of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, every people, every tongue and nation. whom you have made them to be a kingdom of kings and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, a myriad of angels, Around the throne and the four living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them was thousands upon thousands and ten thousands of thousands, myriads and myriads of angels, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things, I, and all things in them I heard say to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped him. In heaven there's a scroll. In the scroll, uh, it's basically God's last will and testament, you would say, for the end of the age. This is it. This is what God has thought and enacted in terms of his timing for the end of the age. Remember I told you about the end of the age is an end to the evil age. How is the evil age going to end? How is God's going to start his purpose for the new heaven and a new earth? No one can know it. No one can act on it. No one can execute it because no one is worthy to open it because that would bring about a judgment against evil, against sin, against humanity. And no man is able to judge another man unless that man has been able to go through that same temptation and overcome it. Okay, in God's standard of justice, the way God judges and his justice is that no man is able to judge another unless that person is able to withstand the same temptation, the same pressures, and overcome them. That's why it's really hard for all of us, right? To ever say to somebody, I never would have done that because we've all in some way have fallen. Yes. And therefore, God would not entrust you to judge anyone. God would not entrust me to judge anybody. That's why we have to be careful in hypocritical judgment is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5. Be careful about hypocritical judgment because you have also can fall and you have also have fallen. So remove the plank out of your own eye and then go get the speck out of your brother's eye. That's the point. But Jesus is different. The Bible says Jesus did stood against the temptation. He did stand against the evil in his life and he was not overcome by it. And that's why he is worthy. But this scroll is the end of the age. What is going to look like? Nobody knows. Nobody can even look into it. Nobody can even... Look into what the scroll is written in. No one in heaven, no one under the earth has, was able to keep himself holy despite the temptation and the pressures of life. No one. No one can. All the religious leaders, all the fake philosophers, everything in life, all the history of mankind, no one is able to stand against the pressures and the temptation and remain holy. And therefore, John begins to cry. He begins to weep. And you wonder, why is he weeping? 
Well, the reason why he's weeping, if no one's able to do it, that means the age will continue without end. This present evil age will continue with nobody ever ending it. Evil will continue. Good and bad will continue to be mixed forever. And God will just have to let time go and let this evil present age continue to go. And who wants to live in that present evil continuous age? Who wants to continue to have things like this happen over and over again in our lives? And so he weeps because God is not going to end this evil age. But one of the elders, right, the council of God, those who execute, those who enact, those who know the will of God, says to John, look, stop weeping. Behold, very Jewish, very, very Jewish Old Testament terms, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has, uh, are worthy. Jesus is worthy. The book of Hebrews tells us over and over again that Jesus was tempted in all, all ways, just like us, yet without sin. He's able to sympathize with us. He's able to see our plight and our need and said, I know what it's like to be a human. I know I've been tempted by you, but I've overcome. And therefore, Jesus is the only one that's worthy to, do, to open it because he knows what it's like to be one of us. Yes. Do you know Jesus worked a lot? <laughs> Those who work a lot, Jesus worked, and he didn't have an office job. He didn't have a cushy job. He worked with his hands. He was a hard worker. He worked as a mason. He worked in building structures like this. Uh, it's a work, I know we translated carpenter, but it's really a work for builder. He was a builder. Jesus worked. Jesus uh, did not demean human labor or did not demean manual labor. He was a man that worked, and he was a man that lived among this whole world, and yet without sin, the same pressures, and was able to overcome each one of the temptations. And that's why he's worthy, because no one can. Right. So you look at yourself, and you go, on my best day, I can't even come close to anything that Jesus has ever done. And yet the humility of our Lord, right, to become the lowest of the slaves, not just the not just the slave that loosened the sandals, but the slave who washed the feet, right? The greatest of all of us, right? The greatest of all of us became the servant of all of us. And that's what Jesus became. He's God because the whole chapter is about the worship of Jesus. And the same things are said about God in chapter 4 are the same things that are said about Jesus in chapter 5. Unequivocally, Jesus is God, just by reading those two chapters. Because who and what angel will actually worship the Lamb, the same way that they worship God, the Father who sits on the throne. An angel would have been banished. That angel would have been destroyed. It would have been the, the utmost heresy and the utmost anathema to have an angel in the presence of God worship another person. You ever thought about that? This angel would have been banished to the uttermost parts of hell. But they're not. They're actually an example of worship because they worship the Lamb, because the Lamb is God. And it says they're weeping, and it says there's a lion, but you can't find a lion. You ever, you ever seen that? The lion of the tribe of Judah, you look, and there's no lion. Chapter, four, I mean, chapter 5 has no lion in it. A new character shows up. And I saw between the throne a lamb. You ever, you ever read that? You go, man, yeah, I'm looking for a lion, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah, he's overcome. Where is he? Nope, I see, uh, I see uh, the living creatures. One looks like has the face of a lion, but that's not him. Where's the lion? The lion became a lamb. It's not referring to the weakness of Jesus, but to the gentleness of Jesus. It's literally the word for a one-year-old ram, a one-year-old lamb. You ever seen a one-year-old lamb? Uh, it's not a cuddly, woodly thing. It's not, you know, it's not so nice. <laughs> they are strong. It's a ram. Remember when Abraham was in the Mount Moriah and God said he would provide himself a ram. It was a, it was a ram caught in the thickness of the bushes. It's the same picture here. He is the ram of God. He is the gentleness and the power of God in one person. How can you have that? Jesus was able to Take little kids and say, the kingdom of heaven is like one of them. And yet he's able to whip people out of hypocrites temple, uh, out of the temple courtyard. The strength and the grace, the strength and the gentleness of God is seen in Jesus. And he says, 
that he's able to open it. He is able to see what's in the book and the scroll. And they were taking the scroll from the one who sits on the throne. It says in verse 8, they fell down and worship the 24 elders and the four living creatures. And they brought bowls of incense, harps and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And this is a beautiful thing. What we just sang, think about this for a moment. What we just sang and what you just prayed are now an eternity and a bull that are presented to Jesus. You ever thought about that? My prayers this morning, when you got on your knees, or if you got on your knees, or if you couldn't get on your knees, and you just pray to the Lord in the, in the closet, in your quiet room, those are brought up to Jesus today. And they're sweet. In fact, this is an Old Testament picture, right, of bringing the incense. The high priest had to bring the incense, the sweet-smelling aroma to God. And this is what it's brought before the Lord, the prayers and praise of the saints. I wonder what they smell like today in the presence of God. You know, there are ones that God doesn't accept. accept. We're told in the book of Isaiah that God did not accept the the incense and the prayers of, of his people, Israel, because they were so sinful so unrepented. Not that God didn't love them, not that God didn't want to answer their prayer, but their prayer was mixed and their prayer was full of sin and therefore God could not accept it. And so today when we pray, it's, it's there. It's in the presence of the Lord. Are you comforted by that? I am. Amen. That it, the Lord knows what my prayers are. Now in the cockpit of heaven, the cockpit of the universe, as he sits on the throne, he sees fit what he must answer and what he must wait and what he must say no to. I don't like that sometimes, but it's true. Are we comfortable with the no's of God? And it took me a long time to accept God's no's. When he said, no, I don't want that for you. But God, I don't want that for you. That's not for you. It was much later in my Christian walk that I said, thank you, Lord, for the no's. I would have destroyed my life. I probably would have been married to someone else. <laughs> I probably, you had those things? No, it was just me? Okay. You know, you, you think you're going to marry someone and you pray and he's like, man. And then 10 years later, you go, praise the Lord. I didn't marry that person. Hallelujah. Right? Thank you, Lord. You told me no. I just, it takes me a while to get it though, right? This, I'm too dense. God's saying, here. And I'm saying, really? But where? The nose of God or the weights of God. That's even harder, isn't it? Yes. The weights of God. Wait. Wait. But when? Wait. And yet, these are incense and prayers to God. Why is Jesus worthy? And we'll finish with this. Why is Jesus worthy? Because of this. They sang a new song. Again, another song. I love that. That's why we have songs today. Lots of them. They sang a new song saying, worthy because you have to take the scroll and break the seals. Remember, this is the, 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 the end of the age. What, how is the age going to end? What is God's plan for the end of the age? That's what the scroll is. Only Jesus can open it. He opens it, and he they, they takes it, and it says that they begin to worship God, or Jesus, because you were slain, and because you purchased for God with your blood men. We have been redeemed, as the apostles told us, not by precious metals, not by what man holds as valuable, silver or gold or any precious thing, but we're bought by his own precious blood. As Paul told the Ephesian church, God purchased the church, the body of Christ, with his own blood, and he's made us kings and priests. Um, he had made them kings and priests. Not only did he redeem sinners like me, from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We have people from different countries or different heritages, different cultures in this fellowship. But God redeemed those people, sinful people, in the slave market of sin. Jesus plucked us out and bought us. By faith in him, we're able to be redeemed. But not only that, he continues to bless you. And he says, I'm going to make you king and priest in my kingdom. How about that for a slave? <laughs> Lord, you bought me as a slave, from a slave market of sin to become your servant. But now you're giving me a position of a king, the position of a priest in your kingdom. We're going to inherit all of what Jesus is going to inherit. And he's going to inherit everything. 
And likewise, we will inherit everything. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have in this world. You're going to inherit everything. And everything means everything. That's an amazing thing. Why? Because he did this for us. He did it for us. You did everything to save man. That's why he's being worshipped. Jesus, you did everything to keep man from hell. You did everything. Which means if man wants to go to hell, that's his choice. It's not God's choice. Jesus did everything that he could to save us from sin and keep us from hell and from the devil. You realize that, right? Amen. The gospel tells us that Jesus redeemed us from sin, kept us from hell, and delivered us from the power of the devil. What an amazing thing that he's done. So he did it all. So why do people go there? Because they reject it. Because they don't want to. Because they see something that's worth more than Jesus. They see something and they have an object of their affection that is worth more than Jesus. But it says, just to finish, I looked and just to continue the worship, there was voices of angels around the throne and living creatures and a number of them was a myriad of myriads and thousands of thousands singing with a loud voice, worthy. Again, that same idea of worthiness, worthiness. Is Jesus worthy? And able to slain, uh, uh, that was slain, the lamb that was slain, to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and might. And every creature and every created thing began to worship Jesus and saying, he's worthy. And in, unfortunately, in our English, it doesn't come out, but it's, it is in the Greek, the, um, to receive the riches, the wisdom, the might, the honor, the glory, the blessing, right? Not just any blessing, the ble- all the blessings, all the worthiness, all the glory, all the power, all the wisdom belongs to Jesus. And then a new group joins in. Every creature begins to worship the Lamb and saying the same thing. The whole universe begins to sing to Jesus. And then we have the final thing, verse 14. And the four living creatures, right, those angels around the throne of God said, Amen. And they fell down and they worshiped the Lord. We haven't even gotten started on what's going to happen in the future, right? People look at Revelation and say, what's going to happen next? And what nation is going to attack who? And how's Israel going to come out? God wants to give us this beautiful vision of heaven where everything is in peace, where God's power is displayed, where his justice is clear, where his worship is uh, uh, there and exalting Jesus. Before we could even get into anything this year, that's the picture God wants us to have. And we can say, worthy is the Lamb. Remember, Jesus had a scroll that he opened up. In Isaiah chapter 61, there's a beautiful prophecy which Jesus fulfilled in Luke chapter 4. Jesus in Capernaum, his hometown, before his whole family and his friends opened up the scroll, another scroll that he opened up. Right? Jesus is used to opening scrolls. But this scroll was from the book of Isaiah, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news, to heal the brokenhearted, to let the prisoners free, and I have to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll. What a beautiful picture. The acceptable year. The time in which God will accept you. A time in which God will accept you and I on the basis of faith and repentance. He will make us born again by his spirit. He will accept us. Any man, any man who bows the knee, he would be accepted. Doesn't matter where he's from, what he's done, or what he has not done. He is accepted on the basis of the redemption that Jesus paid for. Right? That's, that's, that's the basis of it. However, he didn't finish the verse. And in Isaiah, it says, after preaching the acceptable year of the Lord, it says, and to bring the day of judgment of our God. He didn't say that at the Capernaum synagogue. He closed the scroll and sat down, and people were in awe of him because he was proclaiming to be the Messiah. But that prophecy will be fulfilled to now preach the day of vengeance of our God. That is what Jesus is going to open up next. The scroll, the scroll that is, has the seals on uh, uh, the scroll that has the seals on every side, the seven seals on both sides, and now he is going to show us through the book of Revelation, chapter six through nineteen, what the end of the age will look like, 
the end of the age will come at the hand of Jesus. No one else. And that should encourage you and encourage us that he's the one who's going to bring an end to the evil age. And it's going to entail all that chapter 6 through 19 talks about. And we must be ready for it. And we must be ready to accept it. And we must be ready to live through it and be strong through it. Because there's things in there that, my friend, we're ready for an incredible, an incredible time. A difficult year, a difficult time, a difficult moment. Maybe difficult times will come this coming year. I don't know. But I know this. It's the Lord who opened that up. No, not any man. It's the Lord who made that happen. And if it's a difficult year, so be it. I know who opened it. It's the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And if it's a great year in the Lord and his blessings and goodness, then praise the Lord. He did it. And I'm willing to receive both. I'm willing to receive both. Didn't Job say, if we could accept blessings from God, why can't we receive calamities? And it takes as much faith to receive the calamities as it does to receive the blessing. We just like the blessing because that's how we are. Right? That is, yeah. But it takes as much faith to receive the blessing as it does to receive the calamity. Lord, you allowed it. I praise you for it, and I thank you in Jesus. Or it's a blessing. Lord, thank you. I accept it. I believe that you sent this to me in Jesus' name. I believe it. I accept it. And boy, that's maturity, isn't it? And that's what God wants us to be, mature, to be able to see things through his perspective. That's why he gives us this vision of heaven before we even begin to describe the seals. So let's pray together, and let's eat together in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you for all your goodness, all your blessings, as well as your difficulties that you allow in our lives. And Lord, this first century Christians, they had trouble. They had difficulty. You told us in this life we will have trouble, we will have tribulation, we will have difficulties. But be of good cheer. I have overcome. Help us, Lord, to overcome this coming year and its difficulties. But, Lord, help us to be active in serving you, serving others, reaching the lost, bringing, Lord, the good news, the acceptable year of the Lord into people's hearts and minds. Lord, I don't know what to expect. I can think of many things that will happen or, or may happen, but ultimately I can only sit back and look at this year and how it went and praise you for it and thank you for it and honor you for it. And so, Lord, we look ahead to next year and no other place, no better place to be than in the presence of your saints with the people here in this fellowship, Lord, and praising you and honoring you and bring you glory for who you are. You're worthy. You're worthy because you created us. We are just bringing worship to our creator, but also, Lord, because you're sovereign because you are in total control of our lives, and because you saved us, because you redeemed us from where we were. No matter where we came from, you redeemed us, Lord. And you've made us kings and priests of our God. Lord, we couldn't even imagine 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that that was our future. But yet, that was your will, and you delight in it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We should, we should end this with the elders, right? Like the elders said, amen. Let's give one incredible shout that the angels will be jealous or the creatures will be jealous of how we say it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's eat. How are we going to do it, Miss Carol? I'm not